Thanks for watching CMTV. We know you'll be blessed by this week's message. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Visit cmjacksboro.com for more information about our church and ways you can get involved. Thanks for joining us and welcome home. Uh, music team, y'all did a phenomenal job this morning. Thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'll clap for you so nobody's here to clap for you. Y'all uh, have done an awesome job. Uh, appreciate your commitment to be here. Uh, we want to keep everything the way that they're telling us to do, so y'all spread out throughout this room. There's 500 chairs out here, and y'all can find one, surely. And, and today, we have such an honor uh, and such a privilege to, to be able to come to you on, on Facebook and, and, and however else you're listening to us. You know, I don't even have that deal, and now I'm getting to, to be on it, so it, it's an awesome deal. I would love to stand before you and teach this morning. I've got a lot of things going on within me from the beginning of the year. God said that this was a year of rejoicing. And we're going to continue to rejoice. Uh, before all of this came about, before things take place, I've been booking guest speakers to come and speak throughout the year. And I actually booked a guest to come for today. And, and so I called him the other day and I told him, I said, man, I, I, I called you to, because I felt like God said to bring you in. And I said, God knew beforehand that all this was going to happen. And I said, I still want you to come in unless you're scared. And, and so I give him a little challenge and and when you see him as he comes out here, he, he has nothing to be scared of. Uh, this man's name is Israel Banana Baraku. And, and he's, from, he, he's from way of uh, the Dallas area, Frisco area, by way of Nigeria. At 17, he came to the United States all by himself. Uh, he ended up being asked to walk on at USC. He, he walked on the football team, became a starter, was drafted in the NFL by the Dallas Cowboys, and he's going to share some more of his testimonies, some more of the things. But I believe he's got a word for today. I believe he's got a to now word. And so I ask you to welcome him, to receive him. He is my brother from another mother. And he is such a mighty man of God. I believe that God has called him. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. But he's going to come and he's a very gifted teacher. And I believe that God has given him so much information that God wants us to hear. So please, uh, welcome Israel. Oh, my pleasure to be here. You know, can I bring my stuff yep. here? Oh. You're not on. Turn your microphone oh. on. I gave you one thing to do, man. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Well, well, well. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to be here. First of all, I just want to start by saying, welcome to the gospel of connectivity. The gospel of connectivity is the gospel of Christ. And before I start, you know, getting into the message of today, I really want to give a, a hard thanks to the people that brought me here, to Pastor Eugene and his lovely wife and the beautiful family. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here to be a part of your family. And also, I want to thank you for joining as well, you know, to listen. I hope that what I can share today can be an inspiration to you and to your, and to your loved ones as well. And also, uh, I do want to say hello to my wife and my four daughters who could be watching right now, or maybe they're still asleep, who knows, you know, because time has changed with all those things, you know, going on right now. So hello, Amber, hello, Shalom, hello, Rayleigh, Maya, Joy, and Amir. You know, Daddy loves you. You know, Daddy is in Jacksboro, Texas. Could you believe that? You know, <laughs> that's the work of God. When God is doing something, you'll find yourself in many places that you never imagined, you know, you would be, because regardless of what our culture is, once you have Christ, he blends everything together. You know, so that's what the gospel of connectivity is all about. And also, I, I want to recognize the people in New York and Washington State and all over America who are going through some tremendous thing right now with the coronavirus. You know, we, we want you guys to know that, that Christian Missions Church is praying for you and everybody else, you know, I really have you guys in your thoughts and prayers. So stay strong by the grace of God. We will come out of this. Now, so the word I have for you today is something, because I have something written down, planned, but at 4.30 a.m. last night, I was telling you know, Pastor Eugene, uh, the word came to me that said, be still and know that I am the Lord. And I want to go back before I really, you know, you know start trailing off it, to the main meat of the message. Is I grew up in Nigeria, as you know, Pastor you know mentioned. You know, grow up, grow, growing up in Nigeria, I had dreams of coming to America to play football. I had the opportunity to go to London, to Cambridge after I passed, and 
entrance, entrance exam, but I love football so much that I wanted to come to America to play football. So I forsook, you know, going to London to come to America to experience this game called, called football. And before I left, and I'm gonna jump because I, I don't have a lot of you know, time to share this, but before I left, my mom, who is in heaven right now, I believe decided that I'm, I'm here because she prophesied me doing this. Before I left, my mom told me, Israel, do not forget who you are. Do not forget who you are. No matter what you do, stay true to who you are. Stay true to who you are. And I, and I asked her, so mom, what do you mean by that? And she said, because you are a child of God. She said, don't get that twisted. You know. So in throughout my journey from being drafted by the 49ers, I did play for the Cowboys for a short minute but I was drafted by the 49ers. Being drafted by the 49ers to being a teacher, to owning my business, to being a head coach at Desert Christian High School in Lancaster, California, to you know, preaching and going out and sharing the word and just, just living. There's something that I've always bubbled in my spirit, and that is my mother's words. You know, about do not forget about who you are. Because when I look at everything that's happening right now, there's something that we should not forget, who we are. And that is truly what the message is about. The message of today is mostly about identity. You know, when I was a teacher, I used to ask the kids, I said, who are you? You know, many of them would say, you know what, I'll, I'll flow from the heart. I would ask them, who are you? They would say, my name is blah, blah, blah. And they would mention their race. I'm white, I'm black, I'm Hispanic and Japanese or Asian, whatever they want to pick. And I would tell them, that's not who you are because that's just your platform. That's just an instrument. I said, who are you? And they would think, oh, like, oh no, no. You know, they would call me Steve Fine too. They would say, Mr. Fine too, I don't understand what you're saying. I said, because you're not telling me who you are. You know, because if you look at me right now, I can tell you that I am the son of Chimetin Jemanzi and Dr. Mba. And, I, and they gave me the name Israel Mbana Barago. But that's not who I am. So can you tell me who you are? And some, some of them will struggle with that. And then I bring it back to Christ. I would say, who is Christ? And they would say, he's the son of God. I say, no, 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 that's his title. And they say, but he's the son of God. I say, I'm, I'm, not, dis I'm not disputing that. I'm just asking you, who is Christ? And... As time went on, they started to understand what I was asking them because I started to share with them that Christ is unconditional love. Christ is the bridge. Christ is the confidence. That as we live our life, we should not be consumed with the tools that God has given us to define who we are. Because those tools fade away. In my garage, in my house right now, I have a bunch of tools. I am not my tool. I can use those tools but I am not my tool. And I think religion has done a fantastic job of presenting a visual image of who we should be. But in the gap of that, it has missed the real heart of what God wants to do. You know, many people have a relationship with God based upon his ego. Yes, I said it, God's ego. What does that mean? The description. God, the Savior, God, the protector, God, the, you know, the provider. That's the relationship they have with God. But how many people actually have a heart-to-heart -heart with God? Whether they can sit with God and not so much be concerned about what God can do, but who He is. See, this, that's what drives me. You know, when I met, you know, Pastor Eugene, if I was focusing on, on the external if I was focusing on what he could do, chances are I would not be here. Because when I came to America, I, I asked God to reveal to me the hearts of men, not how they think. Because how you think would conflict with how I think in many ways. But if your heart is connected to God, wherever we have a disagreement, we can work it out. I've been married for 25 years now. Me and my wife don't always see eye to eye. But because of our heart towards each other, where we disagree, we always find a way to either compromise or find a way to deal with it. So when I look at what is going on with everything going on right now, with the coronavirus, with the pursuit of man, ask yourself, 
What has man been doing in the last hundred years? We have been mostly consumed with what? Being the best. I want the best clothes. I want money. I want houses. I want, I want all of these things. And as the more we pursue all those ex external things, they're not bad things. Don't get me wrong. I'm not calling anything good or bad. But the more we pursue those things, the more we lose our stillness. The more we pursue those things, the more we lose who we truly are in God. You know, when I was studying, God asked me a question that I, I want to ask you. And that is, did God create the world so that he can gain more power? Think about that for a minute. Did God create this world so that he can gain more power? Was power the purpose why God, God created the world? Or what did he create it for relationship? Those are some of the questions we need to ask ourselves. And then God took me through, what does it profit a man to what? Gain the whole world and what? Lose his soul. Once again, about a relational God. Not a God who is consumed about creating things. Let's face it, God is the most accomplished creator ever known to man. I mean, known to mankind. But yet, what drives God is not his achievements and wanting to be the best and, and all of these things. What drives God is relationship. Now, why is that important? Because the more you connect with God, that's why I call it the government of connectivity. The more you connect with God, the more you know who you are, just like my mother told me. The more you connect with God, the more you discover that you can create as many things without losing yourself. I like what, you know, Pastor Sadie said when she mentioned that she saw the vision of a tree, the wind blowing, but it's still rooted. Exactly. We can create so many wonderful things. We, we can do so many incredible things. I mean, look at, I'm streaming live, talking to people in California, possibly in Nigeria, and so on. But the reason why those people are, you know, turned on to watch me wasn't based on just the technology, it was based on the relationship that we begin to understand that as the coronavirus, as politics, all of these things that seems to divide us, if we are truly children of, if we are truly children of God, we would be connecting in a much deeper, deeper way that none of these things can divide us, just like the wind. The wind is politics. Right now, the nation is divided because of politics. The wind is politics. The wind is racism. The wind is sexism. The, the wind is all of this discrimination that is going on. Everybody just fighting, fighting. But for those who are really connected to God, you will not be moved by any of these things. You know, because you will see to the heart of it. No wonder, I always wonder, I ask God, why was the wind, why did the wind stop? You see, when I study, I ask a lot of questions. I don't know if you can tell. As a former teacher, you know, I ask tons of questions. Christians, some people are even called blasphemers. But I, I discovered something about God. God is not offended by truth. Whether the truth is coming from uh, a man who doesn't know Christ, which is, you know, impossible, because God is the, you know, God is our bread. <laughs> you know, whether it's coming from a man who doesn't know Christ or somebody who knows Christ, you know, somebody who doesn't care or somebody who doesn't care, God is, not, is never offended by truth. Because that's what he, he deals with. But what the Bible tells us, you must worship God in what? In spirit and in what? In truth. So when you sit down and start asking yourself all these questions about who am I in relationship with all of the things? How can I really discover who I am, who am I so that when the political season comes, when the racism comes, when all these things come, to so ask myself, who am I? Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to the original man. Let's go back to the beginning to find out who you are. They said when God made man, he formed out of the world, the dust of the earth. Science tells us that man contains even part of the elements and properties of the sky, of the stars, and so on. But when God made that, if you look at it, the thing didn't move. The body didn't move. The only time the body moved was what was when? 
when God breathed into the body. So the question I ask, I have for you is, are you the dust or are you the spirit? You know, and also, why do we spend most of our time on this earth fighting for the dust? Because that's what religion will use to control and keep the attendance and keep all of that going. Because we spend time just defending our dust. Oh, I'm a black man. Oh, I'm a white man. Oh, I'm a woman. Oh, I'm a woman. Hear me roar. I'm, I'm this. I'm that. I am. No. At the depth of it, I feel like like this. No? Yes, you're white. Get away. You're black. Get away. I, I want to see your heart. That's what we should be pushing for. This now. Coronavirus. Okay. It doesn't mean that you don't take it seriously. It doesn't mean that you don't wash your hands. Believe me, I wash my hands very, several times today. You know, it doesn't mean that you don't listen to science. But one thing I've learned about science and religion versus spirituality is that religion and science pursues the mind of God. What does that mean? Because in the mind is where we have all the logistics. In the mind is where we do all the measurements and calculations. Everything has to be logical. One plus one is two. I used to tell my, my kids, you know, that I used to teach, I was like, one plus one is six. They were like, get out of here. I said, no, no, one plus one is six. I'm like, how did you arrive to that equation? You know what I did? When you take out the cross and isolate everything individually, it's six. I said, it took, it took six lines to make one plus one. So should you ignore that part or just focus on the what? Logic part. See, that's what science does so well. And there's nothing wrong with it. That's what religion does so well. And there's nothing wrong with it. That's why Christ said, I've come to what? Fulfill it. To fulfill the law. To show the law that there is a heart, something greater than the law. You know, these are some of the questions that I ask God. I was like, I don't want to get caught up on the surface. I don't want to get caught up in your mind. I want to get caught up in God's heart. Because I'm not perfect. No one is perfect. You know, let's go back to what I asked a little about Jesus Christ. I said, okay, who is Jesus Christ? You know, that's, that's the title when you say the son of God. The light of the world and all of that. I said, but who is Jesus Christ? One day, I heard a whisper that said, Jesus Christ is unconditional love. Um, I heard that whisper when I was still. I'm, I'm not losing sight. See, I'm saying a lot of things, but I'm, I'm focusing on being still in the presence of God. Being still in your soul. Being still. I said, unconditional love. I said, unconditional love. I said, what is special about unconditional love? This is what's special about Christ. Because a gold digger... And there's nothing wrong with a gold digger. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like to, you know, condemn or, you know, a gold digger will pursue a man or a woman based upon what? What they have, what they can do for them. But in the presence of unconditional love, where there is none of those things, they are still the same person. Because you have unconditional love and you have what? Conditional love. Conditional love is perfect for religion. If you do this, you get this. If you say this, you, do, you know, everything is like written and isolated and, you know, like I said, once again, logical and placed for you. You know, Jewish law has, what, 613 laws. Say, so, yeah, this, this, this. And there's nothing wrong with it. You can follow that path if you want to. But unconditional love has no limitation. Anything is possible. And then God began to reveal to me about Jesus Christ and unconditional love. Is whenever you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, what you're actually saying is, in the name of unconditional love. So that's why people get healed by the name. Because unconditional love does not judge. If you say, in the name of conditional love, that means, did you meet all these requirements? But unconditional love comes and says, I see your spirit. That's why Peter, you know, tells us that God has given us, given us what? An incorruptible spirit. That's what Christ sees. 
That's what unconditional love can see. You see, conditional love can see that. And the only way you can differentiate between the two is if you're still. Still to listen. Still to abandon, abandon your culture, abandon your flesh. Abandon what you see in the mirror. To seek a connection that is deeper than what you've been told. And I, I want to share this with you that I share with you know, Pastor Eugene. And that is the life of Christ. I just say that's what all this is about. When Jesus Christ was ready for his ministry, he was baptized by John the Baptist. And as he was standing there, baptized, he came out of the water. They said the voice came out, the heavens opened up, and the voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm what well pleased. That type of announcement is almost like God put a what? A crown on top of his head. But it's an invisible crown because our crowns are all invisible. So God put a, a word over Christ for everybody to hear. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I'm, I'm pleased. And this is the spirit who then led him to the wilderness. If you take out the E D R, I mean yeah, E R and E S S. If you take out that part, he say took him to the wild. He took him to the wild. Why? Why the wild? Because in the wild anything is possible. But he took him there because Jesus Christ showed us an example of social what? Distancing. Christ distanced himself from everybody to be still. Why? So that he can discover who he is. Who he truly is. Why do I say that? Because on the next uh, sequence of events, we are told that the devil came to tempt him after 40 days and 40 nights. And let me just go back a little bit about that crown. This is important because it's a part of the message. That crown that God put on Christ is an invisible crown. And this is what the question that came to me. Israel, what type of crown are you wearing? Or whose crown are you wearing? Are you wearing the crown God put on you? Or are you wearing the crown that your forefathers put on you? Are you wearing the crown that, remember, you came from heaven. You're not trying to get, get to heaven. You came from heaven. Are you wearing your father's crown, the kingdom's crown? Or are you wearing the crown that the world put on you? So Jesus Christ went into the wilderness with the crown. With the crown his father declared over him, an invisible crown. So while he was there, he was tempted. And I believe he was tempted regarding his identity. Why do I say that? Because as soon as he came out of there, after 40 days and 40 nights, the devil came, and what did the devil, the first thing the devil said, realizing that he's hungry, he said, if, the powerful word, if, if, you are the son of God. You know, most of us, we have stopped with, oh, he was hungry. That's why he said F. But I don't see it that way. Because the more I studied, I realized that he didn't just use the word F there. He used the word F the this time around. Because the devil is so smart, he doesn't tempt you with things that you know you're going to pass. He tempts you with the things that you're questioning in your mind. Because the way he was able to topple Adam and Eve was what? He put a doubt in their mind. He's a powerful doubt creator. So here is Jesus Christ. He said, if you're the son of God, turn this what? Loaf into, I mean stones into bread. And Jesus Christ, he responded with a powerful response. He said, man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that comes out from the mouth of God. In other words, word is spirit. He said, yeah, I recognize that I have flesh. But greater than, my, greater than the tools, remember I said the tools? Greater than the tools that I use to do things is the truth of who I am. Spirit. Spirit. And then the next temptation, he took him to the world. Top and kill, and he said, 
if you really believe that God can save you, what? Jump off this bit and I'll catch you. Uh, and the angels will be sent to, you know, to catch you. I'm paraphrasing right now. And this guy said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Once again, I don't have to see if God loves me by putting myself at risk. That's the powerful thing about it. And then the final one, the third one, a very, very powerful one, is we are all men fail, including myself. The devil said, you see all of this right now? All these powers, show, show them all the powers of the world. All the kingdoms of the world. He said, I will give you this if you do what? Bow down and what? Worship me. And I say that is powerful because all men are susceptible to what? Power. All of us, we are, even women, we are, they are, we are all susceptible to power. But why is this powerful? Because the devil realized that Jesus Christ, on the first temptation, knows who he is. Second temptation, he's not going to try to see if God loves him. He knows God loves him. And then the third one said, okay, since you're a man of purpose, since you're a man that knows that God loves you, since you're a man that knows your identity, you came here for a what? A purpose. So this is what I want you to do. If you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this power so that you can go do your purpose. That's the dangers of power. And then this Christ said, no. Jesus Christ at that moment chose truth of who he is over the pursuit of power. Why? Because if you're in truth, you already have power. Adam and Eve were deceived because they were made to believe that they had no power. And how do you discover all of, all of this? Being still, studying, asking questions, letting God, frankly, break your shell. You know, I stand before you today as a broken man, frankly. You know, because I came here in pursuit of power. I came here in pursuit of, you know, to prove to my dad that I can be a more time millionaire like him. See, I grew up in Nigeria. When most people think of Nigeria, they think of Discovery Channel. You know, people, you know, maybe with bones in their nose or whatever. You know, I, 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 I used to mess with some of my classmates back then. They was like, man, you know, how did you come to Nigeria? I was like, man, I mean, come, come to America. I say, well, I, I got on the canoe and I rowed and, you know, I swung from tree to tree. And they were like, oh, my God, all of this. I said, yes. You know, but I mean, it, it does not offend me. But the reality about what, what I was I was trying to do was, to, you know, basically to draw them in. Because I came here in pursuit of power. The power to prove to my dad that I can be richer. Because he's the one that wanted me to go to Cambridge. That didn't want to go to Cambridge. And when I went to prove him that I'm going to be this and that. So when my NFL career failed, when things started falling apart in my life, because in the NFL, you know, they say not friends for long. That is true. You know, if I showed you my own phone number, it can name who is who. I had their phone number. But your relationship with people in the NFL is often, most of the time, 99.9.99% of the time is determined by how long you play in the NFL and if you're a superstar or not. So my dreams were crushed. I didn't become, I dreamed of holding the Lombardi trophy. You know, my dreams were crushed. Some of the businesses that I, I put together didn't, you know, produce. You know, I gave tons of money to, to you guys heard the story, it's an investment guy who told me that I have properties and showed me the, the piece of paper that I have properties in Denver, condos in downtown Denver. It turns out all of those things were, were a lie. The guy ended up going to jail. So I'm a broken man. 
But I, I realized that God, all these things happen so that God can speak to me. And I didn't realize it why my mom was telling me, going back to my mother, telling me, don't forget who you are. Because my mom told me when I was born, I mean, that God had a hand on me. So I said, one day I'm going to be doing this. I didn't want to do this. I don't want to do this. <laughs> it's been fun to you. Because I have a tendency of just, you know, telling it like it is. I said, God, I don't know if I, I'm from fit for this. I don't know how to speak Christianese. I'm not very good with, you know, you know no, 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 I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that. I love to inspire people. I love to listen to people's stories. I'm inspired by their stories. So God, I don't know if I'm the right person you really want, you know, because I'm not a very Christianese speaking person. So when I meet people like Pastor Eugene and Sadie and their family, I was like, okay, God, I see what you're doing. You know, because who would have thought that a kid who grew up all the way in Nigeria would be here in Jacksonville, Texas, talking? I mean, that in itself is a miracle, man. I, I never imagined it. I imagine myself holding somebody trophy, you know, but that didn't happen. So in closing, well, it's about the time, right? Yeah. So in closing, I want to share this message that is very, very important about the stillness. Because when you're still, that's when you really get to hear God's voice. And in my stillness, God began to speak to me that I'm going to be doing this. That I, you know, I started showing me things that brought me to this, to where I am, to where I'm speaking to you today. And I, I want to leave with this story. Okay. Back to God. For over 400 years, Israelites prayed for a Savior. Because right now we are in the season of Lent. Because I find it interesting, like all of this thing that's happening, is happening during the time that Jesus Christ was in the wilderness. That's why stillness is important. When I hear the government talk about social distancing, I think about what? Stillness. So that we can commune with God. So for 40 years, the Israelites prayed for God to send them a Savior. And God sent them a Savior. Christ. And what happened? He was crucified because he didn't speak the language. They were not still enough or open enough to hear his different sound. Because God has given each and every one of us in this room and people watching different sounds. Different ways on how to see him. Because they didn't see that, they, they did what man always does. When he doesn't understand something, and before we stop pointing fingers, this is what the Holy Spirit saying to me. He said, do you know how many times I have sent you gifts and answers to your prayer because it didn't look the part? You killed it. You avoided it. You abandoned it. Like I've abandoned being here speaking to you. I've not pursued it, frankly. So in this season, I pray that God will reveal to you who you truly are. And then you can make decisions from that. Not from who everybody wants you to be. Because always remember, you are greater than your politics. You're greater than religion. You're greater than your race. You're greater than your gender. Every time you think of yourself, think about that you are the breath of God. And God stands above all of those things. Now, you can use those things and do some, some things, but those things are, are never, ever supposed to be on top of you, dominating you. Supposed to be on top of you. So, I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you for listening. And I just want you to all remember this. As this virus thing goes, I want you to remember that God has given you what? An invisible crown. It's time for us to take out that fake crown 
that is our ego, our pride, our lack of understanding of how connected everything is, frankly, and how powerful, how powerful God's love for you is. That's my, my message to you, and I hope that you and your family will be blessed throughout this season, and know, and know, be still, and know that Jesus Christ is with you, even through this season, because these two shall what? Pass. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Thank you. We are so privileged. We are so honored that you got to be a part of this today. You got to hear an incredible teaching. You got to see God's glory manifested right here before you. As God spoke things to me and I was able to, to give them to, to, to Israel. God is moving. God is working. Coronavirus does not move God. So do not allow it to move you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Fear has to leave. Fear has to go. And so by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we take authority against this coronavirus from assaulting our world, our nation, our state, our community. And we just thank you that the blood of Jesus is against you. We claim and declare that by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. Father, we declare and we decree that we're going to believe your report. And so nothing by any means shall hurt your dwelling place. Yes, nothing shall come near us. We condemn every word spoken in judgment that says that 90% of the world is going to get this. Father, that's not what you said. You said that nothing, not even the gates of hell themselves, will stop your church from moving forward. So we stand on that word. And we send it forth to the body of Christ. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you would like to partner with us financially or support our ministry, it's now easier than ever. When you give to Christian missions, you're sowing into people's lives and advancing the kingdom. Try giving online today by visiting cmjacksboro.com slash give.